the strength giver, the only person you need more than anyone else in the world is Jesus Christ. He is the one that gives you the strength to go on in the trials of life and the burdens that come to us all. He is our strength giver. Though, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. He has given me the strength to go through the valley of the shadow of death. For death is only a shadow, but it is a shadow that we need the strength of God to go through. Finding strength in the midst of life's greatest difficulties seems almost impossible. And some people give up and they do not lift their heads under the hills from whence cometh their, their hope. Their hope and their strength comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. It seems impossible as we look at our country today and as we look at our situations today to go through it with joy. And yet joy is what God gives us. The strength of the Lord gives us the joy of the Lord, which is therefore our strength. You see, we see prophecy being fulfilled all over the place today. I love to listen to one broadcast of the news that comes over the airlines, unless it's Christian news, because that one broadcast, that's all I can take, one broadcast tells me that prophecy is being fulfilled every single day. So the Lord's return is coming sooner than later. And the reality is this, that gives me strength to go on and on and on until the Lord comes. In God's loving arms, we can find refuge from the storms of life. But it is in God's loving arms that we find the courage to move forward in our faith. When we're told not to broadcast the word of God one day, it will take courage from God to broadcast the word of God in any way we possibly can. Because you see, God will give us the strength to do it in the midst of persecution. Remember that the disciples were in the midst of great persecution, but that's when the word of God spread the greatest, in the midst of great persecution. God needs to bring persecution to his children, his churches, so that they'll get on fire or quit the ministry. God doesn't want us to be soldiers that run away from the flames, but into the flames. I like the illustration of those firefighters that will go into the flames even though it could mean their life. They go into the flames because they are dedicated to the cause of putting out fires and to their profession. God wants us as soldiers of Jesus Christ to not flee the battles but go into the battles and present the gospel when the gospel is not a convenient thing to present. Many of our brothers and sisters in this world today are in countries where you are told if you present the word of God, you're going to suffer the consequence, and that could mean that you're crucified, you're put in prisons, or you are tortured in some way. But they go. They go. And America may be coming to the point where we're going to be told that the gospel cannot be presented in its totality. We're already told that if we talk about gays, we are hate speech. If we talk about not aborting children, we are giving hate speech. Well, the word of God talks about it and we talk about it because it's the word of God. We must not shirk our, du our duty to present the gospel in a time when the gospel is beginning to be looked upon as hate speech. We must present the love of God. It is not hate speech. It's deliverance speech. 
and Jesus is our deliverer. So we are in a time when we need the strength of God. We need the strength of God more than ever before. So many people are timid in this culture of the pandemic to present the word of God in creative ways. I know of individuals that used to go door to door. Now they knock on the door, stand at the sidewalk, and shout the word of God to the people that opened the doors. They didn't allow the pandemic to stop them from giving out the gospel message. And neither must we. We must find creative ways. And we found that creative ways by going on to the Facebook and the YouTube uh, internet pages. We found it a long time ago by going on to the public access stations. And we're trying to present it in any way we can. Just recently this week. Because I wanted to get people to go to my site on Facebook, I wore a red suit. Or actually, I took and put a picture on there of when I did wear the red suit. And it still is something I do three times a year. And people, there were loads of people that hit that and watched and made comments on that red suit. It's amazing. Somebody gave me a Mickey Mouse uh, mask today to wear, and uh, who knows, I may take a picture of that and put it on Facebook. It draws people to the site, and when it draws people to the site, they're going to get the messages. They're going to get the word of God. They're going to know that there's some preacher out there that is creatively trying to get the gospel out no matter what. And I am so blessed by all the other preachers that are doing that. They are finding ways to present the gospel even in a pandemic situation because people are going to hell every day. And many of them are going to hell without ever hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a time when we must give the gospel out in any way we possibly can. Unless you're dead you're still a witness for Jesus Christ. Let me take a little water. That proves I'm not dead. <laughs> I need water. Now, the Apostle Paul was intimately familiar, very intimately familiar with enduring great hardships. I could go into all the things that the Apostle Paul went through but it never stopped him from presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. They threw stones at him. He still presented the gospel. They threw stones to the point where he was taken up as dead, and God raised him back up, and he went into the same town and presented the gospel of Jesus Christ. You couldn't keep Paul down. You couldn't keep after they were uh, taken over by the Holy Spirit of God after Pentecost, you couldn't keep the disciples from presenting the word of God, even though they were threatened wherever they went, that if you speak any more in the name of Jesus, then you're going to be in trouble. Trouble is the saint's middle name because the saint, the child of God, that has truly received Jesus Christ can't keep silent. He's receiving the strength of God to create a greater noise out there that the gospel is true and that the world is passing away and heading for hell. So the Apostle Paul is one example. The disciples are another example. I could give you all the Old Testament prophets. They're another example. Let me ask you, are you an example of this as well? In his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul reminds his fellow believers of the hurt and the suffering he endured. In 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9, we read these words, Paul's words in the word of God. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of the troubles which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, 
above strength. We didn't have any strength of our own to survive those troubles. God gave it to us. Inasmuch as we despaired, he says, even of our lives. But we weren't going to keep silent. But we had the sentence, he says, of death in ourselves. When you gave your life to Christ, you died to self, and now you are called to live to Christ. I died when I received Christ and received a brand new life. It's the life that Jesus Christ gave to me. It's called the one new man. It is the life that will not keep silent. The flesh is the old life. And that old life is intimidated by everything that comes down the pike. But the new life is fighting the old life. And the new life, if you fill it with God's word, will succeed in overcoming the old life. But he goes, I had the sentence of death in us that we should not trust in ourselves. That's the purpose. I can't do this. God can but in God who raiseth the dead. My trust and your trust as a servant of Jesus Christ is to have our trust in Jesus Christ. He is God Almighty, and he raises the dead. So every time they try to kill you and it's not God's time for you, you'll come back. You'll scare the dickens out of them. Because you can't kill a servant of God unless God allows it any more than they could kill Jesus until he let them kill him. Note number one on the screen, if you will. As Paul so wisely points out, each of us will be, for, will be faced with trials in life that require strength beyond our human capacity. If you've escaped those trials, it's just because you're shirking the battle. You will not shirk the battle if you are God's servant and committed to him and have said to God, personally, I surrender all to you, Jesus. All to Jesus, I surrender all to him. I freely give goes to him. And we sing it so well, but do we really mean it? The person that means it is going to find that the battle is the Lord's, but there is a battle. There is a battle. When these situations arise that come into our life that we need the strength of God for, we have a choice to make. We can turn inward and blame ourselves or blame God, or we can reach out to God for help. My friends, reaching out to God for help is the solution. My sister died this week. And I reached out to God for the strength and the ability to rejoice in it instead of to mourn over it. And I tried to say to God, well, I did say to God, God, show me how to use this to propagate the gospel. So I started doing it. God showed me so that that death would end up in hopefully somebody knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior. It was not in vain. It was something that God wanted to use for his glory and to win souls to Christ. Every funeral I conduct personally, I give an invitation to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And some of the people that attend those services don't like me for it. But you know what? If one soul gets saved at that very very hard moment, it's worth every single person of us dying and having somebody saved at our funeral. I want everyone to know that Jesus Christ is the answer, and the answer in the times of trials is Jesus giving us the strength to go through them and to rejoice in the midst of those trials that Jesus is all we need. We sing it, but do we mean it? How we respond to trying circumstances is a measure of our faith in Jesus Christ. If I have got a strong 
relationship with Jesus Christ before the trying circumstance, I will be able to go through it and not to falter in my walk with God. I need to prepare for all things that will happen to me in the future that I have for myself. I don't know how long God's got for me, but I need to prepare by getting the word of God in me and continuing to get that word of God in me so that any trial, any circumstance that I go through, I'll have the ammunition to go through it and the power through the word of God. It is the word of God, and it is powerful. The word of God is like a sword. It can pierce discouragement, and it can destroy discouragement. It can pierce loneliness and destroy loneliness because God gives me that strength and that ability to be more than a conqueror, more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is a basic principle for walking through life's difficulties. Even though there will be a valley and a moment of discouragement that comes into all of our lives, we must realize that our way is to submit to God's plan for our life while it is day, not when it gets dark. It is to submit to him and ask for the peace to go through any trial, any circumstance, instead of to listen to the news and get worried about what's going to happen to us as an individual or as a nation. The word of God is our deliverance, and our word, the word of God gives us the ability to go through these circumstances with God's thoughts and be able to approach them with God's mission. All of us are missionaries for Jesus Christ. It isn't just the individual that's on that mission field, that foreign mission field, but God has made you and I a missionary wherever we are. Wherever we are, we are missionaries, and that means we're presenting that God is the answer to all of the problems of life. Job found that out. Job went through more than any one of us will ever go through. He lost his family. He lost his wealth. He lost his health. He lost everything. But he didn't lose God. He didn't lose God. And God got him through and blessed him more than ever in the end of that revelation in the book of Job. God has promised to bless us if we go through the trial looking at our Redeemer and saying, Oh, Lord, if they take my life, yet in my flesh I will see God, as Job said. When you begin to trust God in these times of need and when I do the same, we will soon discover that there is divine strength available to us, more than enough more than we need. God doesn't give you just a little bit to get you through. He gives you a measure that is beyond that to get you through. And I see it in my audience this morning. You have been with the Lord for some time, and God has got you through many trials and many tribulations, and God is not going to let you go now. He's going to strengthen you as you lean on him and not on your own understanding. Note m with me number two on the screen. It expresses itself intellectually, morally, physically, and spiritually, and arises at the moment it is needed. That's the strength of God, to allow you to face and overcome your obstacles. I don't have that ability in myself, but God does. If it's a physical problem, God will help you to go through that physical problem. He doesn't always heal everything, but he does go with us through those problems, and you can be sure he'll give you the grace to go through it if it's physical. Perhaps it is a spiritual problem, and you really 
you can't believe God in some things. You have trouble believing God. You have to pour over the word of God and let the word of God pour over you and the word of God will change us. He will change our thinking. It will change our weakness. It will give us the spiritual strength that we need. But we've got to pour the word of God into us. You know, the word of God is the most owned but the least read. It's the most owned book but the least read. If I'm going to get strength from the word of God, I must be in it daily. I must pour the word of God in me. And if I don't understand some passage, I just simply pour it in and let God do the work. But I don't keep it there after Sunday and not pick it up until the next Sunday. I'm letting the word dwell richly within me so that it can transform me. It changes me. I don't change because I read the word and I'm going to make that so. The word of God will transform each one of us that reads it. In fact, the word of God says in the book of Revelation, those that read this book and not just Revelation but the whole Bible, they will be blessed by God just by reading it. You may not understand it, but God says just commit it to your mind and your mind will be transformed by the word of the living God. God has a plan and he needs us to become more mature than we've ever become in all of our life. This is not a time to sit back and say, I'm going to retire now. I've never thought of retiring ever since I got into the ministry. Never. Re retarded, but not retiring. <laughs> but I'm telling you the truth. I've never thought of it. I've never wanted to quit any church. There have been one or two that have quit me, but I've never quit them until they made it very clear they weren't going to receive the word of God. But I can tell you this. I've never thought of not being a propagator of the word of God as his minister because he called me. He called me. It wasn't a person that called me. It wasn't me that called me. It was God Almighty that called me. And he called you too to be a Christian. And a Christian does the same thing in that world that I do in the pulpit, present the word of God to a dying race. If you don't think they're dying, listen to their proclamations on the news in their political persuasions. They have not got a sound mind. But the Christian has a sound mind. And the Christian can discern what is of God, what is not of God, what must be resisted, and what must be accepted as God's will. But if we don't get the word of God in us and allow that word to keep getting in us, then we're going to fail to have that kind of discernment. And we will not live according to God's plan for our life. This strength that the Apostle Paul has, he had to renew daily. He said, I die daily. What's he dying to? His flesh. He's dying to his, his emotional bends. He's dying to his own will. He's dying to everything daily. And starting to live for Christ. And he made an impact. He's called the greatest missionary that ever lived. He's made an impact on the whole world because he died to self and he lived to Jesus Christ. Are we living for Jesus in these dark days? Number three, it is the power that is available to every child of God, but only through total reliance upon him. God didn't call a pastor 
to do the work of the church. He called the body to do the work of the pastor and the pastor to lead them in that work. But he called us all to be witnesses of these things. He called us all to tell people about Jesus Christ. He called us all to study to show ourselves approved a good workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God, not taking it out of context, but declaring it as God gave it. He called us all to be soldiers of Christ. And like that song goes, soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. He said there's an armor to put on. It's the whole armor of God, and he talks about it through the Apostle Paul. We are to put that on daily. We've got to confess our sins daily to God. Bad thoughts are sins. Bad attitudes are sins. We confess them so that we can be clean before we go to bed at night. Our desire is to be a servant of Jesus Christ that is a clear channel, like the hymn that says, Channels only, blessed Savior. Oh, there's a hymn for everything. Because people believed that they needed to be a channel. They believed that they were a soldier of the cross because they read it in the word of God. And that word gave them the strength to be more than a conqueror in these trying days that they were living in. We're living in nothing compared to what they had to live in. And most of the world is living in today. This is nothing compared to what many Christians are putting up with in many countries in the world right now. I have all kinds of individuals that will write me on Facebook and say, can you come and teach us? And I can't. I don't have that ability. I don't have that ability or call. But they want to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they want to hear it from this little old pastor. And they're willing to hear it from a donkey. I couldn't find one, so I had to tell them. But there is a ministry. It's called the Greater Grace Ministry, and they can help you. But don't you see, they're hungry for what we take for granted here in America. There's a church on every corner. We can get every flavor of the word that we want, and some are sour. They're begging for somebody to come over and tell them the gospel. And I point them to my Facebook page and say, all my messages are there. Listen to them. And I tell them I will pray for them. And I pray online for them. I don't do it vocally. I just write down the prayer. And they're so grateful they got a prayer for their problem. You see, we must be looking at these situations and saying, oh, my God, how can I make this witness? Will it be through somebody on Facebook that I lead them to Jesus Christ? Will I find a way to do it on YouTube? I, I, this going to be closed one day. They will not want what we are giving, the word of God, on these channels. Conservative views are already being taken off. Soon they will say, we don't want anything that is called the Bible. And while we can do it, Let's do it with all of our hearts. Let's present the word of God to a world that has found out what it is to not have freedom to present the word of God. In China, they're putting people in jail just for proclaiming the word of God. That's happening right now. There's a great desire by the people in charge to destroy anything that is not of their persuasion. And so they are putting people in jail. And even one of our missionaries had to leave there because he would have been put in jail if he'd stayed. Think of it. What?
you and I are receiving in our churches, if it's the word of God, they wished with all their heart they could have that blessing. I find so many pastors are saying, please, please support the ministry because people who don't come don't support in many cases. Churches are going bankrupt because people that come feel the obligation to support it. People that don't come in many of those churches, they just don't feel that obligation. And churches are going out of business that are propagating the word of God. It is serious business. This pandemic is causing many people not to go to church where the safest place is in a church that takes precautions, but nevertheless, they're getting their mind and their spirit and their morality where it ought to be. According to God's guidance and direction, it is not a time to go less to church. It's a time to find ways to go to church more in safe ways. My friends, the pandemic is killing churches. There are some places like California where you can't even enter a church. And if you assemble together in groups, you are arrested. That can spread very easily. I can go to Walmart, and so can a lot of other people, but I'm told it's dangerous to go to church. It sure is. You might get the gospel of Jesus Christ and be transformed by the word of God and become a saint of God heading for heaven one day, but in this life presenting the gospel. Oh, it's dangerous, but it's dangerous to those that are heading for hell. It's very dangerous. The tragedies of our lives can be transformed into triumphs if we find our source of strength is Jesus Christ and we let him fill us daily with the word of the living God. Essentially, all the strength to survive, the power to endure, the ability to overcome is found in our walk with Jesus Christ. We sing the song, he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. How often has he done that for you? If you're not walking with him daily, you haven't heard it daily. But I can tell you, I know that God walks with me. I'm not the greatest Christian that ever lived. I'm sure of that. But I know God walks with me because I believe his word and his truth. Why did God send the Holy Spirit to live within us? Because he understood that we were weak and we had frailties. We couldn't do it on our own. The little child says to his parents, let me walk alone. I can do it alone. Or he's got a bicycle and the parent has been helping him keep balanced on the bicycle. And the child says, I can do it, mommy. I can do it. Let me go. And you know what happens. The child can't do it on their own. And I believe that song says, I can't even walk without him holding my hand. I cannot be more than a conqueror without Jesus holding my hand. I cannot be a, a survivor in the midst of those that are, are just turning away from God in this time of stress. I cannot believe God's going to protect me if I do what God tells me to do unless I'm walking with God. But I know that my Redeemer liveth and that if I will simply do what God has commanded me to do, he would not command me to do anything that would be dangerous to my walk with him. Then I shall be more than a conqueror, and the word of God shall not fall to the ground. The word of God shall not fall to the ground. He knew, God knew, we could not survive on our own he knew that we would not have the ability 
to be more than a conqueror, even as he knew the disciples couldn't make it without him. They tried to, and one betrayed him, and the other denied him three times, and probably the others fell too, because they tried to walk without him. But he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Hold my hand. Hold my hand. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me on. Lead me home. What is the purpose of our trials? The answer can be found in Philippians 4.13, where Paul makes a familiar statement that we often will quote. It is this, I can do all things. No, don't you mean some things, Jesus? No, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I can do it through Christ. I can go through the death of a loved one through Christ that will give me the strength. I can go through the trials that are coming against us in this world today through Christ who gives me the strength. I can't do it on my own. I need my daddy, and he's my daddy. Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy. Do you know how Paul learned the value of that statement? Note with me number four on the screen. The discovery came through experiencing trials and being thrown into impossible situations. He only learned that when God put him in situations that he needed it for. And you and I only will know that deep down when God puts us through situations or has put us through situations where we need it. I cannot know that God will take care of my finances till I tithe. Then I know because God has. But for a long time, I didn't know that. I wasn't for it even when my wife was for it. And then God got to work on me, and I grew up a little bit. And I began to do what she said, but not desiring to, just because I wanted a little peace in the family. In time, it became very clear that God would bless me if I did that. To this very day, I'm a wealthy man. Maybe not as the world sees it, but I'm a wealthy man. I have all I need. He has promised to give us all we need, not all we want. And that's what Christians get all mixed up with. God, I want this Mercedes. I, I want this huge big screen TV. I've told you, and some of you may remember this, there's an organ in the other room. It's in the office. I bought that in my first ministry because I thought I needed it. It's, it's uh, one that lights up, and you know where the notes are, and you can press it because the paper also has that same lights on it, blue, red, whatever, and you can play it. I haven't played it for so many years. I don't know if it works anymore. I didn't need it, but I thought I needed it. I thought I needed it. So often we think we need something we don't need. We need only what Jesus gives us. Jesus has promised to supply all our need according to his riches in Christ Jesus, and therefore I need strength to go through trying hours. I need strength to go through any situation that is a trial, therefore, I will receive it if I seek it with all my heart. Now, how can you be assured of God's strength? Surprisingly, the answer lies in weakness. It's the opposite of strength. God's trying to make me weak so I need him. If I was strong, I wouldn't talk with him. I've got everything I want. 
It reminds me of that song that we have changed the words to. And uh, what, what's the title of that old Frank Sinatra song? I did it my way. And good old blue eyes. He did it his way. I hope he got God's way in there somehow. But I can tell you this. When I sing it, it's got her words she put to it. It's called I did it God's way. You can't succeed in doing it your way. You only succeed as God looks at success when you do it God's way. Everything else is not a reality. Note number five, if you will. What does all this mean? It means that when we are weak, when we are at the end of our ropes, we can exchange our weakness for the glory of God's strength. Think about that. When I am weak, I don't give up and say, I can't do that, Pastor. I say, oh, God, give me the strength to do that because you told me the same thing you told the pastor, that that's what you want me to do. And the reality is this. I can't do it, but God can. I was an introvert growing up. I didn't want to get before an audience. When the youth group that I was in, they had me get up, and all I did was stutter. This was a, a, about a trip, trip we took, and wh I was reporting back to the youth group on it. I felt so nervous. I couldn't do it. And then God called me to the ministry. He called me young. I knew what he was up to because he called me young, and uh, that's why I was in church, and that's why I was in that youth group. I knew what God wanted, but I had no strength, no strength at all. And then God put me in my first pulpit, Wolfboro Falls, New Hampshire, my first preaching in that particular church, any church, had my notes all gathered together. They enforced in that church, strange thing, I had to wear a robe. Now these robes, I mean the black part of that robe is down here. You, got, you could fit five people in that robe's arm. And I made a gesture because I was going to preach. Oh, boy, I was Billy Graham's. I mean, Billy Graham was going to have to take a side trip because I was <laughs> all the notes. And God made sure they went under the pulpit. Shortest message I ever had. I guess it, things have changed a little bit now, haven't they? I can tell you that God established depending on God. Then we had a yoke situation here where we, I preached in an earlier church service in uh, another part of the state, came here after Sunday school and preached here. And I left my notes there. What am I going to do? I don't have the notes. I've got to have the notes. And God said, no, you don't. You just need me. And I preached the word of God that God gave me. And somebody at the back said, that was the best message I ever heard. Boy, that put me in my place. They knew nothing, of course. We know that. They know. But the reality is this. When I learned to depend on God, God supplied what I needed. You'd be surprised how much of this message is not down on these pages. We may go five hours because of it. No, we won't go five hours. But I can tell you this. God anoints somebody that just wants to give his word out. And he bores people if that's not what he's up to. God, just speak through me or I don't want to get up, and I said that more than once to God before I ever got up to preach his word. 
What does it mean? It means that God made me weak before he could use me. And he's going to make us all weak, or you know this to be true in your life, before he can use us like he wants to use us. It means that when we're weak, when we're at the end of our ropes, when we just feel we can't do it, God says, trust me, rely upon me. Number six, it means that to the degree you are willing to be weak, to that same degree you are willing to experience his strength. To the degree I'm willing for him to make me weak. And boy, when I get up to sing, I am weak. I am weak. More than once, God has showed me that. But if I'm willing in my weakness to do it, God will bless it. God will bless it. When I'm willing to get up and preach, when I'm weak, when I've gone through trials and tribulations, but I know, and there's a lot of people in this, this ministry that are in bad situations physically, and it does bother your pastor, and he does want them to get well. But when God says, I'll give you the strength, I'll preach through you, I'll sing through you, I'll do it all through you, because now you're weak, and I'll get the glory. Not you, not you. I'll get the glory. And God loves his servants to speak, giving him the glory. God said in Matthew 5, 3, Be poor in spirit, full of weakness and humility. Serve him knowing you can't do it, but with him you can do all things. And you and I learn that it's in our weakest moments that we feel so helpless in those weakest moments. I remember Corrine having a problem. All of a sudden she had to do her teaching on computer. She did it for a long time face to face and all of a sudden the pandemic made her do her lessons and teaching on a computer and she was very weak. She said, I'm weak. And God brought her somebody to teach her and get her through with flying colors. When we were there and saw what she was doing, I said, I guess God came through for you. I didn't tell her that, but I knew it. I knew it because she was so weak, she needed God to do something, and God did it. And if it worked for Corrine, if it works for me, if it certainly works for my wife, I'm sure it's working for you. God wants you in your weakest moment to rely on his strength. I've been in this pulpit when I didn't want to be in this pulpit because I wasn't feeling well. Things were going very bad physically with me, and I almost fainted once. You didn't know that. Because I asked for God's strength, and he got me through. You see, the reality is this. If you're weak, you depend on God. And when you depend on God, he gets you through. He gets you through. And that's the reality, friends. Number seven, when you receive Christ as your personal Savior, you joined a war. You joined a war. You became a soldier of Jesus Christ. Yet, as a treasured child of God, you are not a soldier that has to do it on your own. You do it through the strength of God Almighty. You rely upon God. Number eight, his strength is inexhaustible. He's got enough strength. Well, if I ask him, I'll, I'll empty him. He won't have the strength to give someone else. I mean, think of all the people that depend on him for strength. I don't want to bug him. Come on. Don't you know who God is? He spoke, and things were created. He flung out the stars. I can't even fling out a rock properly. He flung out the stars, 
He calls them all by name. God isn't some wimp. God is almighty. And he knows you by name and everyone else. Do you realize you serve a mighty God? I look at the galaxies that they show through the Hubble telescope, and I say, God did that. God did that. And, and there's more galaxies that I haven't seen. They go on and on and on. And God did that. God's been a busy God. And he's not too busy to help you, to strengthen you, to encourage you. God is not too busy to take your need and meet it. Number nine, God's strength is not something you have to beg or work for. It's a free gift. It's a free gift for anyone that will receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. It comes through acknowledging that we cannot do these things on our own. There is no greater expression of trust than to say this, Father, I can't do this myself, but I know you are able. Father, I can't do it, but I know you are, so we're going to do it together, and you're going to give me the strength to do it. And as you reach out to him, you find he's reaching out to you. He's reaching out to you. Number 10. Your strong and merciful heavenly Father who walks with you each day, he's there, is ready to envelop you in his unconditional love. You've seen the footprints in the sand. And in that poem, it very clearly states, it says, the reason why there was only one set of prints, it was because I was carrying you. God will carry us. God will sustain us. God will strengthen us. All we have to do is commit it all to him and say all to Jesus, I surrender. And God Give me the strength to do what you just told me you want me to do in your word. I want to be of use to you until you call me home. And I receive, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in the things I gave you to do. I will make you ruler over many things. Oh, cannot imagine what those many things really are talking about. Because God's kept it a secret. But when you get there and you've been faithful down here, you'll find out it is better than you ever could imagine. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we're so overjoyed that we can not walk through this life in our own strength because we, we just can't do that, God. We know we can't do it. We're grown up enough to know that we cannot even walk without you holding our hand. We cannot live the Christian life without you giving us the capacity to live it. We cannot honor you and do anything you want us to do without you empowering us. So, Father, we come to you and we ask you to help us as we adventure in this world in the next few years, few months, whatever you have for us. May we have the testimony we were more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, our Lord. For those listening to this on the Internet or on public access TV, and you've never received Christ as your Savior. You like what you've heard, but you, you really haven't experienced it because you've never asked Jesus Christ to forgive your sins and come into your life. You can do that right now. You don't have to wait. 
This is the acceptable time. This is the day of salvation, says the word of God. Will you not acknowledge your need of Jesus? You may not understand it all. I didn't when I came to Christ, but I understand enough that God loved me. God sent his son to die on the cross to pay for my sins, and God raised him from the dead, and he ever liveth in heaven right now to plead our case. He keeps us saved. Will you not receive Christ as your Savior if you haven't? And if you will, simply bow your head and say this to God. He'll hear you. Dear Father in heaven, dear God, forgive me for my sins. I know I have sinned against you and against others. Please forgive me. Come into my life, Jesus. I want you to be my Savior. I want to go to heaven when I die. And I want your Holy Spirit to live within me while I'm alive. I ask you to do this. Come into my life and save me. In Jesus' name. Right now. Amen. God bless you as you've done this. Please write us. Let us know if you've received Christ as your Savior. You can write us by way of uh, snail uh, mail. That's called Writing to the Bible Speaks, 40 Belvedere Street, Lakeport, New Hampshire. That's the Bible Speaks, 40 Belvedere Street, Lakeport, New Hampshire, zip code 03246. Or you can email us, if it's easier, on the beautiful computer, the internet, and write to us at our hornet 2 at metricast.net. That's our hornet 2 at metricast.net. God bless you as you let us know of your salvation or what else we may be able to do to help you in your